Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dan Gorodnik, Chair of the City Planning Commission and Director of the Department of City Planning. Welcome to today's review session of the City Planning Commission. We are joined today by Commissioners Vice Chair Knuckles, Mr. Benjamin, Cerullo, Dweck, Gold, Goodrich, Kermani, Marin, Osorio, and Ramprashad on Zoom. Before we get to today's agenda, I'd like to take a moment to go over uh, some citywide and neighborhood planning news from the last couple of weeks. I was very happy to have attended Speaker Adrian Adams' State of the City address uh, last week, where she emphasized the need to build more homes to tackle our housing crisis and create a more affordable New York City. We at the Department of City Planning look forward to working with the speaker and taking bold action through City of Yes for housing opportunity to build a little more housing in every neighborhood. Together, we can create the housing New Yorkers need. On that note, I would like to invite New Yorkers to join City Planning later this month on Wednesday, March 27, for our next public information session on this proposal for City of Yes for housing opportunity. For this meeting, we are focusing our discussion on missing middle housing types such as transit-oriented development and town center zoning that would create modest three to five story buildings with stores on the street and apartments above. You can register for that info session at nyc.gov forward slash yes housing opportunity. Earlier this month, city planning also shared our draft zoning plan for Midtown South which envisions a 24-7 mixed-use neighborhood across 42 Manhattan blocks where housing is not currently permitted. The Midtown South mixed-use plan seeks to allow new housing, map mandatory inclusionary housing for permanently income-restricted homes, open opportunities for live, work, and adopt flexible residential conversion rules. These changes would allow for the creation of nearly 4,000 new homes and approximately 1,000 of them would be income restricted. You can read more about this plan at midtownsouthplan.nyc. Shifting to today's agenda, we'll start with a series of land use actions related to the Prince's Point development in Prince's Bay on the south shore of Staten Island. This proposal would map four new streets and complete a 108 home development near Lemon Creek Park and Wolf's Pond along with protection of designated open space and a public waterfront esplanade. The community would be within walking distance to acres of city-owned parkland. Moving to Brooklyn, we'll also begin a public review on 3033 Avenue V in Sheepshead Bay. This mixed-use building would include nearly 110 new homes, of which around 30 would be income restricted, as well as ground floor retail. If approved, tenants would live only a few blocks from Marine Park and several bus lines. Today, the Commission will also look at City Council modifications related to the mandatory inclusionary housing option for the East 94th Street rezoning. If approved, this rezoning would enable a mixed-use building with more than 450 homes, over 100 of which would be income-restricted and ground floor commercial and community facility uses. Thanks to Councilmember Julie Menon for her support of the project, which will create new mixed-income housing in a well-resourced, amenity-rich neighborhood in Manhattan. It's a great step forward and the type of thing we will need more of in order to tackle our housing crisis. We will also review a city council modification on the Jennings Hall expansion in Williamsburg, which would facilitate the addition of 218 affordable senior homes through the Affordable Independent Residences for Seniors, or AIRS, program. These homes would add to the existing 150 units already found on the campus. Then, of course, we will have a brief prep for Wednesday's public hearings, and that'll be it for the day. So with that, Sarah, please take it away. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Planning Commission review session for Monday, March 18th, 2024. The time is 1.05 p.m., and a quorum is present. The first item on our agenda is a certification of a city map amendment, zoning authorization, and a modification of a legal document in Staten Island Community District 3. Our presenter is Vincent Giordano. All right, Vincent, welcome. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, thank you. Um, this is Prince's Point Development, located in Special South Richmond Development District of Staten Island's Community District 3. Uh, 
This is a private application by PBML LLC requesting three land use actions, a city map action to establish four new 50 foot wide public streets on the city map of New York, a Richmond district authorization pursuant to ZR section 10764 to alter the boundaries of a previously approved subdivision application, and a legal document action to amend an existing restrictive declaration. These actions would facilitate the development of 108 single family residences with 14 existing and 94 new homes proposed, along with four new public streets, public open space, and public waterfront access. This project is located in Staten Island's Princes Bay neighborhood, comprising two tax blocks and 124 total tax lots. It is surrounded by the Raritan and Princes Bays. There have been a series of previous land use actions on this development site going back to the year 1989. In 1989, the commission issued a set of land use approvals to facilitate a large scale residential development of 396 units, public open space, designated open space, waterfront access, a rezoning from M11 and M12 to R32 and C3, a special permit, and a restrictive declaration with an associated site plan. In 2004, the commission approved a 123 lot subdivision with an amended, with an amended restrictive declaration to facilitate the development of 123 single family and two family residences. In 2005, an amended restrictive declaration with updated site and landscaping plans was approved by the commission. In 2007, the commission approved a new 124 lot subdivision with another amended restrictive declaration to facilitate the development of 128 single family homes. Most recently, in 2010, the CPC approved the fifth amended restrictive declaration with updated site plans and altered pedestrian pathways. This is the proposed project area. The subject site is bordered by Lemon Creek Park and Seguin Avenue to the west, Purdy Place to the north, Wolf's Pond Park and Holton Avenue to the northeast, Raritan Bay to the southeast, and Prince's Bay to the southwest. The 14 existing homes can be seen in the image directly fronting Purdy Place. Behind them is an existing tidal wetland that the applicant is proposing to preserve. There is an existing 30-foot wide public waterfront esplanade constructed following the original 1989 approvals. Finally, there is an existing coastal revetment built in the year 2000 to mitigate potential flooding. The surrounding neighborhood context consists of mostly one and two family residences and several acres of public parkland. There is a C11 commercial overlay directly to the north of the site which contains a small number of mixed use and commercial developments. As mentioned earlier, this site is partially improved by 14 existing residences, while the remainder of the site is vacant. This map indicates the contours of potential flooding on the development site. The coastal region up to the existing coastal revetment lies in the 1% annual chance of flooding area while inland portions surrounding the vacant interior lie in the 0.2% annual chance of flooding area. The majority of the development site is elevated above the floodplain. Furthermore, the applicant proposes construction in accordance with American Society of Civil Engineers standards for flood, resili flood resistant design and New York City Building Code Appendix G. These two images provide context to the site's existing conditions. In the left-hand image, the tidal wetlands are visible looking south near Purdy Place. In the right-hand image, the 14 existing residences are visible while looking west from near the coastal revetment. Next, in the left-hand image, the existing waterfront esplanade is visible while looking south along the coast. In the right-hand image, the site's vacant interior can be seen looking north with the existing residences seen in the background. The proposed street network resulting from the street mapping action is visible in this plan. The four proposed 50 foot wide map streets are Dune Lane, Schooner Lane, Anchorage Lane, and Coastal Loop. Along each newly mapped street, there will be eight foot sidewalks consisting of five foot wide walking paths and three foot wide planting strips with four foot wide strips instead where street trees are proposed. 
For the 94 newly proposed homes, storm and sanitary sewers will be installed underneath the four proposed streets. There is an existing storm sewer located at the tidal wetlands southeast corner. And an existing sanitary sewer outfall is located at the intersection of Purdy Place and Holton Avenue. Finally, a proposed storm sewer outfall will be built just due north of the western intersection of Coastal Loop and Dune Lane. This landscaping plan indicates the locations of proposed street trees to be planted in the proposed four foot wide sidewalk planting strips. This plan indicates the location of existing and proposed public access points and open spaces. The existing 30 foot wide waterfront esplanade is visible in violet. The existing coastal revetment is visible in pink. Two proposed esplanade overlooks consisting of public seating and vegetation are visible in light orange. The existing tidal wetland, which the applicant proposes to preserve, is visible in green. The proposed pedestrian public access areas for the tidal wetland and waterfront esplanade are visible in blue. And finally, proposed rain gardens in between the rear yards of each proposed residence are visible in gray. Last but not least, this is the proposed subdivision site plan. The applicant is seeking the 10764 authorization to alter the 2007 subdivision approval issued by the commission so as to accommodate the proposed widths of the new mapped streets. The applicant states that they meet the required findings under ZR 10764. First, that all designated open space, topography, and trees of six inch caliber or greater would be preserved to the greatest extent possible. And second, that the proposal avoids destruction of irreplaceable natural features and maintains natural ecological balance with minimal disruption to these natural features. The third and last finding for the authorization is not applicable since the proposed development does not front on a South Richmond District arterial street. In summary, the applicant PBML LLC requests three land use actions. A city map action to establish four new 50 foot wide public streets on the city map of New York. A Richmond district authorization pursuant to ZR section 10764 to alter the boundaries of a previously approved subdivision application. And finally, a legal document action to amend an existing restrictive declaration. These actions would facilitate the development of 108 single family homes with 14 existing and 94 new homes proposed along with four new public streets, public open space and public waterfront access. This concludes the presentation and I'm open to any questions. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go uh, in a moment to Commissioner Gold, but let me just just ask you to clarify one one point. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the Preservation of trees, open spaces, um, those are findings for the authorization. Those are not the amendments to the, in the legal document action, correct? Yes, they are simply seeking to amend the previous restrictive declaration to meet the updated site plan. Okay, got it. So you have the authorization, you have the LD action, which is to change the prior one to fit the new site plan. Correct. Okay, I got it. Commissioner Gold, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Very comprehensive. Um, so just um, to sort of gel what we have versus what we're asking for. So it sounds like we're going from 124 to 114 and we're adding four map streets, if, if I'm catching this correctly. And I guess <clears throat> what I was hoping you could walk us through is aside from uh, the difference, right, to create some space for the, the map streets, mm -hmm. um, what else has, has changed from the original approval? Right, so I mean, is it just, is that where we're losing the 10 uh, homes or the 10 lots? So, well, to clarify, the, the 14 existing homes were from the previous, the most recent okay. subdivision approval. Um, so in total, there would be 128 single family homes. Um, so the 14 that are, have been constructed are um, all single family detached, two stories. Um, in terms of what has changed, you know, as I mentioned before, this is um, a development area that has been around since 1989, been a number of major changes. 
Um, the approvals were granted prior to lower density growth management areas, which I will get into in the next presentation in a little bit more detail. Um, the special permit for that original 396 unit large scale residential development expired in 1999. Um, ZR Section 1142 prevents that from being renewed um, after a certain amount of time when it's, there's been no substantial construction. Um, as for the original design, um, there were a large number of multifamily homes as well, um, but due to some changes in the evolution of the site plan and evolution of you know, the application um, and a series of applications over many years, including the adoption of LDGMA and some of its zoning requirements, um, the applicant has over time kind of restricted what um, their development proposal is going to be. Also, there were concerns about flooding. Um, so the applicant has, over time, evolved the site plan to try to meet um, newer uh, flood design resilience requirements over time. And so the original, also, the original didn't have the four streets? Is that what we're saying? The original, if I remember correctly, um, there was a proposal to do private roads. Um, but uh, due, to, due to some issues with that, um, the applicant instead decided to go with uh, proposing public streets and title vesting them to the city of New York. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cerullo? I just want to say, I, it, it, I whispered to Commissioner <laughs> Benjamin that when you went back to the first slide that began in 1989, we actually both remember <laughs> that, which is frightening, um, and, and happy to see this. Again, um, <laughs> moving through certification. So we'll be we'll look forward to the community's input on this. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Osorio, Commissioner Benjamin. Thank you, Chair. Thanks so much for the presentation. Two quick questions. Um, in, in terms of the condition regarding the preservation of the topography, can you, can you explain a little bit to what extent the topography is going to be actually modified? It sounds like a, you know, the flooding maps show that there's a drastic difference. And so I, I just, I'm wondering if you can explain that in a little more detail. And two, can you explain the uh, adaptation, inundation interventions in a little more detail? How, how exactly would they work? Yes. Yeah, so um, I believe I mentioned it very briefly before, um, but basically the site was elevated on the interior of the site, which explains kind of that island portion in a way where it's um, majority of the site is elevated above both floodplains. Um, George, I'm not sure if you could speak a little to the exact building specifications. Or I guess the question is because if it's if if is it, will it be leveled? It won't need to be leveled to a drastic um, extent in South Richmond. Um, trees that are greater than six inch caliper uh, need to be preserved. If they're less than six inch caliper, those are as of right. Um, they don't have provisions. Similarly, with topography, there's a two foot vertical threshold. So we. From what we understand, we can check the grading plan again, but from what we, um, or we can check the site plan again. Um, there's no grading plan, my apologies. We can check the site plan to see if uh, all those topographic modifications are within two feet. Um, but from what we understand, um, some of the buildings might be elevated a little bit to comply with Appendix G. So from what we understand on the grand scale, there, there will not be <laughs> modification to a greater extent, uh, more, than, more than two feet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's useful. And I, I would love to see, to see that. But the, the other question is then, can you explain that in the context of the flooding mitigation interventions? The, the steepness of topography? No, yes. Well, the, the, the projected uh, topographical intervention with the uh, inundation uh, mitigation oh, the intervention, okay. yes. Okay. How, yeah, how will those two work that. together? There yeah. is an existing, I mentioned it before, um, I'll go back very quickly. Um, in that pink, you can see there is a coastal revetment. Basically, a revetment is a major flooding mitigation technique where um, large rocks are poured. And what it does is it behaves almost like sand dunes where it um, prevents too much excess flooding. Um, I also mentioned before there is a tidal wetland, um, which is going to be preserved. So there is that open space. Um, that is not going to be destroyed. Um, so those are the particulars that are um, have been developed. But as you can see in the actual um, public and open spaces plan, um, most of the homes are going to be far from the esplanade. Um, so in terms of the actual flooding, there will be some homes that might be built within some of the floodplain, but the majority of the homes are going to be located out of it and far from the actual initial coastline. Thank you. That's very useful. Maybe one quick follow-up. Uh, can you explain also the extent to which this was impacted by Sandy? And in addition to just uh, inundation, what is the expected wave action and how will the revestment 
a sort of like relate to that. Yes, so I'm not 100% sure about the exact history with Sandy. I can follow up with you, Commissioner, um, and specifically about you know, inundation, because um, I believe the applicant has a little bit more detail in their, their um, environmental assessment statement, and I can speak with EARD about that in more detail. Thanks so much. And if, and if, if, you, if it's possible to see an overlay of the Sandy impacted areas, that will be awesome. Thank you. And to your question, Commissioner, here is the flood map again, just so you have an idea. Um, to your question, I think you mentioned trees as well. Um, there are no trees of existing six-inch caliber or greater that are going to be destroyed. Um, there are none on the site. The site is largely a meadow and largely a grassland. So there's no gonna, not going to be any, any tree destruction going on. I just, uh, Katie Ferrara, uh, DCB Staten Island office. I, I just would add that uh, we've also engaged directly with DEP in their initial review of, of this. Um, of this site, uh, and and they made extensive recommendations about uh, where homes could be located in relation to uh, the the C hotline. So, so noting where where um, wave action is expected. Uh, so the applicants directly engaged, and again, as, as Vincent said, we'll we'll share a lot more details. Mm -hmm. I think about what the Appendix G applicability means for the design of the homes, uh, as well as the rest of the site uh, as we go through public review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Benjamin. Yeah, since you mentioned DEP, um, on these now, when we did the environmental review of this project in 1989, I was the director of Seeker, um, and the streets were private, and the infrastructure was going to be private, and if I recall correctly, was going to go to a private package treatment plant. Mm -hmm. Obviously, things have changed since then. DEP no longer wants to have private package treatment plants. Um, but the infrastructure that's going to go in here, both water and sewer, is that being done as a capital project by DEP, or is the developer paying for it, and it is being designed by them in conjunction and approval by DEP? How is that working? Yes, yeah, so there's been a, a very long series of communications over many years with DEP, um, going back to the most recent uh, proposal. Um, I can get you more specific details about what DEP's ideas are for that. Um, I do believe it, um, the applicant is um, proposing most of that construction, um, if I remember correctly. But like I said, I can follow up with you on the specifics because th there are some very complicated details about what is being proposed. Just one, one clarification. Uh, you know, we're recalling, and, and we can get you further details, but probably the site plan that reviewed in 1989 had like a private uh, like treatment. Private right, package. That's what I said, a private package right. treatment. So, so yeah. that is, the, that, the, that's they're, they're proposed PET to plug doesn't. into the public system. They, they were right. There were no private sewers opinion. back. There were no sewers in this part right. of the right. right. And no in one. those days, I was at DEP, and DEP was perfectly fine with private treatment, package treatment plants, but since then, DEP has taken over many of them because they have not been well run, and the developments that had them did not want to pay more money so that they would be well maintained. So DEP took them over. So I'm perfectly happy with seeing that there's going to be public sewers and public water, but I'd like to know who's going to pay for it and how it's going to be sequenced to make sure that when the houses come online, the sewers will be ready to receive them. Absolutely. Of course. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, great. Well, with that, um, this item is now certified. Thank you, Vincent. Thank and you, I have Sarah. a feeling we were going to see you uh, again right now. So <laughs> don't, don't move. I'm not moving uh, a muscle. The second item on our agenda is a non ULA <laughs> referral of a zoning text amendment in Staten Island Community District 3. Our presenter is Vincent Giordano. How you been, Vincent? Very good. good. <laughs> Last five seconds, very good. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners again. Um, this is Prince's Point Vesting Amendment located in the Special South Richmond Development District of Staten Island's Community District 3. This application is being in considered in conjunction with the previous Prince's Point Development private application. This is an application by the New York City Department of City Planning seeking a zoning text amendment action to reinstate vesting language for developments approved prior to the adoption of Lower Density Growth Management Areas, or LDGMA. The proposed text amendment is applicable throughout the Special South Richmond Development District. However, only four distinct project sites would be affected by the requested action, comprising five tax blocks and 137 total tax lots. Two of these tax blocks are the development site for the previous Prince's Point Development application.
Okay. Um, yeah, Vincent, we, <laughs> we have the disco version of your presentation uh, up right now. I'll tell you what, why don't you proceed, and I'm going to see if I can get that fixed while you go, if you can, if you can manage. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, ma I'll match the, the disco vibe. <laughs> Lower Density Growth Management Areas, or LDGMA, were adopted in 2004 to address concerns of overdevelopment in certain neighborhoods. Among other things, LDGMA set larger yard sizes, required more off-street parking, and required more open space than underlying zoning would normally necessitate in certain low-density residential districts. To accommodate site plans approved prior to the adoption of LDGMA in 2004, a vesting provision under ZR Section 1145B1 was included, which allowed developments that had site plans satisfying certain conditions to build according to pre-LDGMA requirements. These developments had to have contained a portion of the waterfront esplanade, designated open space, and the presence of a restrictive declaration with associated site plans outlining access to both the waterfront and designated open space or spaces. This vesting provision was removed from the zoning resolution as part of South Richmond zoning relief in November 2023. The first site affected by this text amendment is Princess Point Development. To summarize from the earlier presentation, this is a private application requesting three land use actions a Richmond District authorization pursuant to ZR Section 10764 to alter the boundaries of a previously approved subdivision application, a city map action to establish four new 50-foot wide public streets on the city map of New York, and a legal document action to amend an existing restrictive declaration. Development on this site has held commission approvals and a restrictive declaration on file since 1989. Since then, the site's owner has returned with plan amendments that have resulted in subsequent approved plans. As outlined in the previous presentation, an application is currently before Department of City Planning. The current site plan for Prince's Point development includes off-street parking spaces located in the front yard of proposed residences and rear yard depths of 20 feet. Each of these design elements would be permitted under pre-LDGMA zoning. Given the prior approvals, the applicant had prepared their site plan and the Department of City Planning had conducted internal review under the assumption of vesting per ZR Section 1145B1. This is the timeline of Prince's Point development and its associated land use actions going back to the year 1989 with the adoption of LDGMA and South Richmond zoning relief outlined. Starting with the original approvals for a large scale residential development in 1989, these plans were subsequently adjusted between 1999 and 2010 through a series of new subdivision approvals and amendments to the original restrictive declaration. Following the adoption of South Richmond zoning relief in November of 2023, the department came to an understanding that the text edit removing the vesting provision resulted in inadvertent effects on Prince's Point development. LDGMA's requirements for larger yard depths and parking on the side yards that proposed about proposed residences could reduce the number of homes proposed by the applicant by a third. The department's further review of the effect on Prince's Point development helped uncover a limited set of other potentially affected sites. The second project site is Central Park East Estates, directly to the northeast of Prince's Point development. The site received commission subdivision approval in 2010 to facilitate the development of 25 single family residences. The site was also the former location of Spanish Colony, consisting of 75 bungalow-style cottages. Most of these cottages were demolished to make way for the new proposed single-family residences. Today, the site contains a partially built residential development. Moving northeast, the third project site is 16 Wakefield Road, a single waterfront parcel located in the Annadale neighborhood. In 1991, the Commission approved a certification for tree restoration and substitution of planting materials. The site was subject to a notice of restrictions in 1993 with associated site plans containing designated open space and waterfront access. The site is currently improved with an existing residence with no known plans for site improvement. Finally, the fourth project site is 134 Goodall Street. 
This site receives approval by the Commission for certification of designated open space preservation in the year 1996. The site was subject to a restrictive declaration in 1999 with associated site plans containing designated open space and waterfront access. In a similar vein, this site is improved by an existing residence with no known site improvement plans. In summary, this is an application by the Department of City Planning seeking a zoning text amendment action to reinstate the ZR 1145B1 vesting provision as ZR 1145B for developments approved prior to the adoption of lower density growth management areas or LDGMA with the full proposed zoning text visible on the slide. This is the same vesting provision that existed prior to the adoption of South Richmond zoning relief. This concludes the presentation and I'm open to questions. Thanks, Vincent. So if the department had identified these four sites, Princess Point plus the other three that you mentioned, <clears throat> as needing the vesting provision, would the department have proposed uh, deleting it in the first instance? That was something we had considered, um, but we decided against that, uh, mostly because um, we, we felt um, just given the site plans and given what had been approved before, um, the actual text amendment um, made, made more sense. Yeah, let's yes, and uh, yes, sorry, George Sidorovich, Deputy Director, um, I guess point person on South Richmond Zoning Relief. Um, this was uh, inadvertent, as Vincent said, during our review. We assumed that um, any project that wasn't built in the past 20 years, um, you know, may not be built. And we uh, did not realize, uh, due to some staffing constraints at the time and just an oversight on our part, that this project was, has been on again and off again since 1989, was now back on again, and it was on hold uh, in our system. Um, so this was raised after the public hearing uh, or after the public re referral period by the applicant team. Um, they hadn't realized it during the referral period either, but we, we um, acknowledged it, and now this is um, the, the result of, of that. This application is re the result of that. Okay, and so the, prov the provision that we, had, we deleted, it said that if you had a prior pr approval of your plan before LGDMA was adopted, mm -hmm. and you had a restric restrictive declaration, you had waterfront space, you hadn't broken ground, you could still proceed even though it didn't comply with the newer zoning. Exactly. Um, and the, the, the practical impact here for this site related to um, uh, rear yard depths mm -hmm. and parking, is that right? Yeah, yeah, location of parking. Okay, so one of them was 30 feet requirement on rear yards under LGDMA as opposed to 20 as proposed here, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. And the second was about um, parking uh, on front yards. Right, an allowance that they can be in front of the street wall facade, the front front facing portion of the building. Okay. And, and if an application was approved um, prior to 2004 and it had a restrictive declaration, it had all the thresholds, waterfront esplanade, and so forth, then you could continue as you said and something that, you know, I think we would like to know for the public record um, is something that we, sh we should consider as we're updating our zoning for housing opportunity, because um, as the applicant will probably say during their public hearing, as, as they've said to us, um, LDGMA has restricted the number of houses that you can build. Um, so it's not, it's not really presenting opportunities for housing. Um, and we're currently reviewing the lower density growth management rules, which have restricted housing. Um, but it, it's kind of um, coincidental that this provision for LDGMA is being reviewed now in this public application that DCP is putting forth, and we will probably revisit this again whenever the provision for housing opportunity is referred in a couple months, I believe. So it's a little precursor to that. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you. We're going to refer this one out to the community board and for our president for 60 days. We appreciate it. Um, okay, let's uh, let's move on. The next item on the calendar is calendar three of Brooklyn certification, 3033 Avenue V rezoning. And I'll welcome our team. Sarah, go ahead and introduce them. 
The third item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in Brooklyn Community District 15. Presenting for the first time to the commission is Marzia Rufai. All right, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Um, This is certification for a rezoning application in Brooklyn Community District 15. Um, this is an application by Ford Call Properties at 3033 Avenue V for a zoning map amendment from our four um, with a C12 to our 7 d and a text amendment to Appendix F to map MIH options one and two um, to facilitate a new nine story mixed use development with approximately 112,000 square foot. The development will comprise of 109 dwelling units, with at least 27 to 33 of which being permanently affordable. Um, additionally, the development includes a 13,000 square foot of commercial use at the ground floor and approximately 98,000 square foot of residential floor area. The surrounding area is characterized by residential and commercial uses with one and two family residences to the north and um, to the north and west, sorry. The Niger North Strand and Sheepshead Bay houses to the south and additional commercial uses to the east. The Niger buildings contains um, six stories. Further east is a mixture of multi-family residences, single family homes, and smaller commercial and um, community facility uses. On Avenue U to the north of the project site, Properties within the C12 commercial overlay are improved with one or two family homes, commercial establishments, and mixed buildings with residences above ground floor retail. Nearby public facilities and institutions include the Kings Bay Y at the intersection of North Strand Avenue and Avenue V, and the Young Israel or Bedford Synagogue, synagogue sorry, located at Avenue U between Herring Street and Brown Street. Educational uses include the Big Dreams Child Care Center at the intersection of Avenue U and 4th Street to the north of the project area, and PS 194 Raul Wallenberg um, School, which is located on Nav Street, located um, just southeast of the project area. Here is a closer look at the surrounding area from the north. You can see the development site outlined in yellow and the NYCHA houses to the south across Avenue V. Um, Avenue V and Cole Street are characterized as, um, categorized as white streets at 90 feet and 80 feet wide, respectively. Ford Street is 60 feet wide, one way northbound street. Um, also, numerous, numerous New York City bus lines serve the area, including the B3 line, which runs along Avenue U from Gravestone to Bergen Beach and provides services to the Avenue U MTA subway station. This station also serves the Kill line. Um, in addition, the project area is served by B36, which runs from Northern Avenue and Avenue U to Corny Island, and the B44 and B44 SBS line, um, which runs north-south from Williamsburg to Sheepshead Bay. The project area is approximately 20,000 square feet. Sorry. The project area is approximately 20,000 square feet in size, and encompasses the entire block frontage between Call Street and Ford Street with 100 feet of north side of Avenue V. The area is currently improved with approximately 12,000 square foot, one story building constructed in 1950. Um, this building contains 11 commercial establishments. The project area also contains um, two cap cuts, one along Call Street and another along Ford Street. It, um, the area also has 12 accessory off street parking. This slide shows um, land uses and zoning districts in the area. As noted, you can see the NYCHA houses to the south, the commercial uses along Avenue U and Cole Street, and the residential uses to the west. Um, the project area, coterminous with the development site, comprises Lot 36 on tax block 7367. The area is located within an R5 district. This has remained unchanged since being designated as such in 1961. Um, the 2134 Call Street rezoning, adopted in 2022, rezoned two tax lots directly um, adjacent to the project site. This, um, directly adjacent to the project site 
to the north from an R4 district with a C12 commercial overlay to an R6A district with a C24 commercial overlay. You can see this project area here outlined in blue. Um, this rezoning was intended to facilitate a mixed-use development with approximately 120 apartments and commercial spaces at the ground floor. The zoning districts mapped within the surrounding area include the R4, R5, R6A, um, and R6A residential districts. Most of the surrounding area also have a C12, a C22, or a C24 commercial overlay districts mapped over the underlying um, residential districts. Our four districts are generally, generally found to the north and west of the project area, while our five districts cover several blocks to the south and east of the project um, area, including the Nitra North Strand and Sheepshead Bay houses. And our 6A district was recently mapped directly to the north of the project area. Um, this is the aforementioned 2134 um, Call Street rezoning. This is a picture of the development site facing northeast from the intersection of um, from the intersection of Avenue V and Ford Street. The development site contains numerous establishments, including a liquor store, a medical center, a pharmacy, two restaurants, a beauty salon, a, um, a smoke shop, and a deli. One of the establishments is currently vacant. This is another picture of the development site facing northwest from Avenue V. This picture shows a much closer look of the establishments mentioned before. This is a view of Avenue V um, facing east from Ford Street. The development site is at the left in this picture. And this is a view of Ford Street facing north from Avenue V. The development site is at the right. The proposed development is a nine-story, 112,000 square foot building with approximately 13,000 square feet of, resident, um, of commercial use at the ground floor and approximately 98,000 square feet of residential floor area. The building will include 109 um, residential units, of which 27 to 33 will be constructed pursuant to the MIH program. Um, the proposed building will rise to a maximum height of 95 feet but will include um, several setbacks, including a 22-inch deep setback along um, Ford Street above the first story and a 25 um, setback at the sixth and seventh floor at the rear end of the property. The ground floor of the proposed building will contain a residential lobby on Avenue V and a, res um, and a residential entrance on Call Street. The building will contain common terraces on the second and ninth floor, as well as a common terrace on the, on the rooftop. While the building will require either 43 to 45 um, parking spaces, depending on the MIH option selected, um, the building will contain 109 attended parking spaces in two subgrade levels, with 86 spaces on double staircase and 23 spaces at grade, including nine accessible spaces. The applicant has noted the excess parking spaces are being provided as a response to community concerns. Additionally, a driveway with a 22-inch um, curb will also be located on Call Street. The proposed building will contain eight ground floor commercial, eight ground floor commercial tenant spaces, ranging from approximately 700 to 5,000 square feet in size. To facilitate the proposed development, the action requested a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from an R4 with a C12 to an R7D with a C24, and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing um, area in Appendix F with options 1 and 2 in the new R7D C24 district. Um, our 7D districts are medium density cons um, contextual residential districts that allow a maximum FAR of 5.6 for residential uses when mapped within an MIH, an MIH area, sorry. A maximum base height of 95 feet and a maximum building height of 115 feet. Residential buildings must comply with quality housing regulations. Um, all street parking is generally required for 50% of market rate dwelling unit and 15% of income restricted dwelling units. When mapped across an R7D seventy districts, C24 commercial overlays have a maximum commercial FAR of 2.0. 2. 
the applicant proposes a zoning map amendment to change the project area from an R4 with a C12 to an R7D with a C24. The applicant seeks a zoning text amendment to map MIH options one and two within the um, proposed project area. Option one requires that a minimum of 25% of the residential floor area be designated as affordable to households any income with an average not exceeding 60% AMI. Option two requires that a minimum of 30% of the residential floor area be designated as affordable to households any income with an average not exceeding 80% AMI. Um, you can also see the area for MIH area here. This is the MIH area map as part of the previously mentioned 2134 Call Street rezoning. First one to local law 78 of 2021. This application requires a racial equity report on housing and opportunity because um, it would increase the permitted residential floor area by at least 50,000 square feet. The applicant says that the proposal would um, also produce new income restricted housing, um, new income restricted housing units in a location that has low income and is highly accessible to transit and jobs. The median household income for Shift Head Bay is approximately 68,000. Um, between 2010 and 2020, the area's Asian population increased by 41%. The white population decreased by 7%. The Hispanic population increased by 21%, and the black population increased by 26%. The population of Community District 15 is predominantly white non-Hispanic at about 63%, followed by Asian non-Hispanic at 20%, and Hispanic population and black population at 9% and 4% respectively. In conclusion, the applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment. Um, is seeking a zoning map amendment from an R4 with a C12 to an R7D with a C24, and a zoning text amendment to Appendix F to map MIH options one and two to facilitate a new nine-story mixed-use building with 109 um, dwelling units, including 27 to 33 income restricted under the MIH options one. Uh, option one, sorry, as well as the 13,000 square feet of commercial facility space and a 98,000 for residential and provision for 109 parking spaces. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. And first of all, sorry about the flashing light. Uh, that's going to be a uh, point of challenge for us today. So thank you. And great job for first presentation. Love it. You. Congrats. You did a great job. Um, yeah. Uh, let me just uh, observe one one thing and then and pose a question. Um, in in this situation, we have a developer that is uh, proposing 109 units and 109 parking spaces, of which only some 55, 57, or 60 ish are required. Um, under our upcoming uh, CVS for Housing opportunity proposal, uh, even if we eliminated that minimum mandate for parking. Uh, a developer such as this one would continue to be able to propose what they are proposing here. I, I just want to note that because I think there's, it, it, it is frequently misunderstood and will be frequently misunderstood as to what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, this is just an interesting example of that. Okay, um, let's just talk about R7D here. Um, I noted from the presentation that, uh, that there is R five to the south and east, R6A uh, to the north, R4 to the north and west. Um, this looks like we are uh, proposing to set a new context here with R7D. Um, can you say a little bit about why the, the, the applicant uh, believes this makes uh, sense here and, um, and how we should think about it? Uh, yes, absolutely, and thank you for the question. Um, you know, as you noted, uh, this is a kind of predominantly lower density um, kind of surrounding area here. Um, the commission did see an application for 2134 Coil Street, which mapped uh, an R6A, which is a medium density residential district, to the north. Um, and we'll note that as part of that application, the department looked at that block comprehensively and identified um, that medium R6A district as appropriate for the mid-block 
and looked at both of the end blocks as potential opportunities for increasing the density a little bit higher than the R6A. I'll also note that um, there are two wide streets, both Coyle Street and Avenue B. Um, there's the context of the, the, no, the Nostrand and Sheepshead Bay houses to the south, and which are um, quite set back from the street, even increasing the width of the distance between those houses and this proposed development site. Um, the applicant can speak more about the exact zoning district they selected, but um, those are some of the reasons why we thought um, adding a little bit more density here was appropriate. Great, thank you. Uh, let me start with Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the chair touched on my question, but perhaps uh, an R7A would be more appropriate if you're looking for a little bit of a bump and staying within that recent R6A framework. Um, certainly that would also be, uh, you know, higher district than an R6A, as you point out. I think the applicant could speak to why this exact district is appropriate for what they're intending to build here. It also gives some more flexibility on the building height and locating the, the commercial uses back on this site, too. Do, do we have any indication what we would lose as far as apartments uh, if it went down to an R7A? I think we'd have to come back with that information. We can make sure the applicant speaks to that when they at the public hearing. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Goodridge? Thank you. Um, my question is about uh, the rent, if I could find um, Oh, I did. Okay. So I noticed that the for the at the eighty percent AMI a two bedroom is twenty five forty. Yeah. And um it it for that specific neighborhood, that's also about the same for a market rate apartment for a two bedroom. And I've been noticing this a few times of where the income restricted rent is the same as what a market rate rent would be. And um, I'm wondering why that is and if there's some background. And I've been trying to figure, that, is, it, is it that the buildings are newer? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I overall have an issue with the so-called affordable housing, but this is just one tiny aspect of it. So, and I see it here in this project, so I wanted to ask about that. Um, thank you so much for your question. I don't believe we have the answer as to why that is the case, but the applicant can definitely speak more to that okay. in the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Two quick follow-up questions. Um, in terms of the, um, the amount of density, I noticed the, EA, the EAS uh, notes a 1.02% reduction in open space, not enough to be significant, therefore the negative declaration. But I'm wondering if, if you can explain a little bit the extent to which those terraces that you highlighted are going to be available in some of the lower floors and on the roof will be available to everyone, or are these private spaces? Uh, anything that you can clarify on that at this moment? Um, is this question about the rendering? No, this is about the amount of open space uh, that could potentially be available to everybody in the building oh, okay. from the proposed, yes. I think we'll take that question back to the applicant as well. Um, I believe that the terraces um, at the lower floors are for the the residents of those spaces, um, but we can inquire about the rooftop as well. Thank you so much. And, and a second quick question. So this is outside of the 100-year floodplain, but um, very close to it, sorry, up very close to the 500, and then with the projections, it sounds like it will be impacted, and so I'm wondering if, if you can discuss a little bit the, the provisions that are being discussed right now to protect the building against flooding. It sounds like with the ground floor retail ostensibly, you know, that will be the impact. But I'm wondering if the applicant can do a little bit more in terms of permeability in and around, and or I, I'm just curious to hearing, you know, what's the rationale, what are, what, what is the, the, the applicant sort of like the, discussed in this regard? Sure, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think the applicant can speak more to that. Okay. Have, yeah. okay, cool. So in, and the, it, maybe in that context, if you can also ask the applicant to share a little bit more about the sustainability measures, like what's going to be the treatment for the roof, whether there's going to be any renewals, um, okay. whether the applicant is going to take advantage of the incentives created with carbon neutrality, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Benjamin. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very comprehensive. Um, I had a question, and I think it's probably for the applicant. The first one is the businesses that are currently on the site, 
Do we have any idea how many employees they have and where they're going or whether they will just be closed? No. Um, thank you for your question. I think they have about 20 to 25 employees right now. Um, their current zoning would allow and support um, what they intend to do. Um, the applicant can definitely answer to as to what the businesses are going. The okay, because I was wondering if they had, and you can ask them, if they had any intention of trying to relocate them back into the commercial spaces on the ground floor once they're finished, or if we are going to just lose these businesses potentially. And my second question was about the stackers. Uh, the way they're achieving their 109 parking spaces is that they're going to have two-level stackers, which have been problematic in a number of buildings. So do we have more information on how they envision the stackers operating or if you can get more information from them on how they envision the stackers operating? I would appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Benjamin. Okay. Great. Again, congratulations to you and thank you. And this item is now certified. We'll look forward to picking it up uh, in the process. Uh, and let's move on to the next item of the agenda today. The fourth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review for site selection and acquisition in Brooklyn Community District 7. Our presenter is Juki Sai. Hello, Juki. Hello. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Haven't we seen you on this before? <laughs> Right. Good afternoon. <clears throat> this is an application for a site selection acquisition action jointly sought by the New York City Department of Finance, DOF, and the New York City Department of Citywide, Sur Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, to facilitate 31,900 square feet of space for DOF for active storage and furniture refurbishment as well as 750 square feet of space on the adjacent parking lot at 853rd Avenue in Sunset Park, Community District 7, Brooklyn. This application is certified on November 27, 2023, and the public hearing is this Wednesday. Community Board 7 did not hear this item and submitted a waiver of recommendation. On February 28, 2024, the Brooklyn Borough President held a public hearing, and on March 6, 2024, submitted a recommendation to approve the application with no conditions. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Mr. Benjamin. Well, as you know, the last time when you uh, presented the last use of this facility, I believe it was by HRA? The HRA office space application, yes. I had a number of concerns about this building being targeted by DCAS for office use as opposed to manufacturing use. Yes. And I know this is much smaller than the HRA facility, but it seems as if this is a go-to location at this point for other than manufacturing. Are we... I know we're going to see another one from ACS. Right. And that's fairly small also, but we seem to be chipping away. Yeah. Is there any is anyone looking at filling this space with actual manufacturing? Uh, so I can uh, I'll let the applicant speak to their selection process, but I guess Commissioner Benjamin, when you say anyone like the, is the question uh, in the city is anyone yeah. doing that? Okay. Yeah. Um, Are we marketing it? Is the city or um, EDC marketing this to any manufacturers or makers? I mean, we've talked about the need for maker space, and we have this building that's not fully occupied that could function in that way and was presented way back as the potential, and we just don't seem to be using it that way. Yeah, so this is something, and I'll, I'll 
defer to the applicant on their process, and I think they can speak more thoroughly to the DCAS site selection process. Uh, just a couple quick points on it. Um, since EDC, they were they originally owned it, but that Salmar Properties, a private owner, currently owns it. Uh, I do believe there is quite a bit of vacant space still in the building, um, and I can get you the exact number. Um, I think it's close to 500,000 square feet. I also know that recently the ground floor tenant actually vacated, um, which was a, a larger big box store. Um, all that said... Was that Bed Bath & Beyond? Uh, you know, I'm going to double check. I believe it was Bed Bath & Beyond or World Market. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to yeah. say w exactly which one. Um, because I'm not positive, but we can follow up on that. Uh, all, all that to say, oh, sorry, Commissioner. I was talking about that and beyond. Got it. Okay. Um, all that to say, there's uh, what we can say. There's still quite a bit of vacant space um, in this property specifically, um, and uh, as far as like plans by the city. Um, since this is a private owner, I'm I'm not currently aware of like specific plans by the city to market this property. But in terms of industry city generally, it seems as if the uses there now are either retail or re like um, Lilac, the the chocolate company that's there, or some of the others that make a product and then have retail operations. But it are we okay with, we as planners, yeah. okay with this area, industry city, moving from manufacturing to office and commercial retail? So I guess this is a pretty broad question. Um, I'll try to, uh, again, I think the applicant will answer a lot of questions. Um, uh, and I don't want to speak fully for, you know, the department on this subject. Well, I, the things I just do want to point out specifically about this property, again, and the broader area, is I think there is high demand for ground floor space with high ceilings, where, A, you can load much more easily, and, B, more modern machinery is able to fit. Because this is an upper floor site, it's the fifth floor, and I believe the ceiling heights are close to 12 feet, I think it actually is not as well suited for some of the more modern manufacturing uses um, that are seen like more throughout uh, the M3 zone. And so that just, again, speaking to the details of this mm -hmm. building, I just wanted to share that as far as the much broader policy um, implications here, I'll, I'll wait for further discussion from the department. Thank you very much. I'm not trying to be, oh, no, yeah. I'm just, this area has really seen a lot of development, but not the development that we originally thought we were going to see. And so if we're, we're incrementally changing, and I just want to make us aware each time that the increments add up. Absolutely. Thanks, Mr. And Benjamin. I know that we did change the deed restriction so that we could have more of these other uses. So I'm aware that we, at some level, thought this would happen, but I think we really need to remember it each time we see one of these. And, and one thing, I just to follow up, I'm going to plug here the Intro 1012 bill, um, the research that the department is doing on citywide industrial uses, and there's going to be a lot of forthcoming research on that conducted by the department um, as part of the city council mandated bill. So you'll be hearing a lot more on it. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I, I appreciate both the, the questions that Commissioner Benjamin is asking and the point that you just made about that bill. And just for the benefit of this conversation, this building has had that deed restriction um, about limiting the amount of office space, office space that can be used, which is 260,000 square feet. Yeah. This, not office space, 31,000 square feet does not count against it because it's storage. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. It does not count against that part of the deed restriction. Right. And so there has not been an effort to, to amend the deed restriction. 
they they just not at 260,000 square feet of office yet. It sounds yeah. like is that right? Yeah. So we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll keep an eye on that. But I I, I take your point, Commissioner. Let's go, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Hello, good to see you again. Thanks for the presentation. I I um I have similar questions. I'm I'm not trying not to repeat to to build on that instead. Before I do that, I wanted to ask if you can explain a little bit what the furniture refurbishment includes. Like, what is what exactly, and how much space is going to be used for that? So I can go back to this slide. Um, actually, Commissioner, sorry, can I? The applicant, I think, will be able to speak more clearly to that on the exact specifics of the space. Can I let them speak to that, and then if you have follow-up questions, we can address that after the public hearing. Well, sure, but I mean, can you just provide a little bit of, of like, from your point of view, like, what exactly is that? That's, that's all my question for now. Okay. Um, sorry, I can go back. In, in fact, just the, the proportion of how much is going to be used for that. It's quite a small portion. It's okay. that blue shaded portion in the upper left-hand corner, I believe. Um, what I will say is I think the majority of this space is being used for active storage uses. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. That's useful. The, the second question has to do with Table 2, the list of properties that, was, um, that were assessed to, to land on this option. I'm wondering if you can ask the applicant to provide a little bit more information on, on what made the other options cost prohibitive. Can we see a little bit more detail in terms of how this property relates to the other options that they found? Sounds like for the most part it was the cost, with only two of the other ones uh, not appropriately sized. Yes, I can pass that along to the applicant. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The the other thing is, I w I'm wondering if we can request um, some type of written statement from EDC. A, I know that in the past we received one. Thanks again so much for following up on your, on our questions regarding this property when when it has come up. But in this case, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, less interested in the the deed restrictions, which we know, as the chair pointed out, that you know allow this. But instead, sort of like understand to Commissioner uh, Benjamin's point, how does this property fall in the larger EDC sort of like major proposal that was announced a couple weeks ago, in terms of intensively attracting green jobs in the city and and given the fact that this is within an SMIA I, I'm, I'm really interested in understanding why does this keep coming up to for non-industrial uses if if there is such an an, an active kind of like initiative to to attract green businesses this sounds to me like a perfect location for that uh, I can I can I don't believe EDC is part of the applicant team here um, but I can convey that question to the applicant. Yes, thank you. No, no, no. My, my question is whether we can ask EDC okay. to comment on this, whether they think what is the best use for this in terms of their larger plan for green manufacturing in New York. So as far as I, I'm not sure if EDC, like as far as making a broad policy statement as related to this explicit application, that's something I'll take back to the office, but Makes sense. I, I'm, I know that we're engaging all the city agencies in the 1012 discussions, um, and I can I can see what I can do in, in terms of what their comment on this would be. Thank you, thank you. I understand that EDC is not you know related with the property nor the application, but there is, is across the street. This is across the street from significant city-owned property managed by EDC. And I want to understand how does this fit in, uh, relate to the larger land use policy that the city has on this part of the waterfront. The, the other thing, the last thing I would say is in, in response to Commissioner Benjamin's question, when, you know, I, I think that we should go back to the WRP, well, actually not the WRP, but the comprehensive waterfront plan, and the city's stated policy of for attracting a a work or to preserving and expanding a working waterfront. This is within the SMIA. And so perhaps we either sort of like ratify that policy or, or, or change it. But this to me sounds like uh, creating a little bit of a conflict with what the city is saying is the land use policy for the working waterfront and kind of like the constant proposal of non-industrial uses on this specific property. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Sir, I can I can definitely um, 
yeah, raise that point. And, and again, I just wanted to reiterate, reiterate with this property. Um, I think both uh, as we've talked about the, the demand for, or as I mentioned earlier, the demand for industrial space is high in Sunset Park. Um, but, you know, I've spoken with our partners at SBID, or not partners, the local industrial service organization, and a lot of my understanding, again, is there's a, a lot of demand for ground floor space, higher ceiling space, slightly newer space for the newer manufacturing needs. Um, and I think this space is slightly distinct um, as far as, again, its location on an upper floor, uh, the building capacity, as well as the ceiling height. And I just wanted to mention that, again, in the context of why this is a, like a, a building that, um, you know, this might be a selection for this process. But I'll let, again, let the applicants speak to their selection process um, when they speak on, on Wednesday. Thank you. Fair enough. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Goodrich. About, uh, the community board waiver. Is that common? I don't think it's it's always common. I have spoken with the district manager at Community Board 7. Uh, I believe <clears throat> what I was told from the district manager is that um, they, did, they saw this as a relatively uncontroversial application. Um, there have been applications at this site before, um, and also that uh, they're working through all of the, the text amendments, CCN, CEO, and soon to be CHO, um, and they were just having some little capacity issues as far as assembling a quorum um, for their applications. But again, yeah, that was to do with the waiver. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Commissioner. All right, Juki, thank you for this. We'll pick this one up at the public hearing on Wednesday. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Sarah, what's next? The fifth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review for a major concession in Manhattan Community District 5. Our presenter is Jonil Clark. All right, welcome. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, commissioners. This is an application by the New York City Department of Transportation and they're seeking a major concession along Broadway from West 41st Street to West 53rd Street um, in Manhattan Community District 5. So currently there's an existing 38,000 square feet of, of concession area on Broadway and 7th Avenue from West 41st to West 47th Street and the applicant is proposing to add approximately 214,000 square feet of concession area to this. Zoning districts in the area include the C67 district and the theater subdistrict, and the project area is located in the Times Square and Midtown West neighborhoods. So the map on this slide shows the existing 38,000 square feet of concession area in blue, and the proposed additional 214,000 square feet is shown in red. The proposed concession would align the concession area with the existing pedestrian plaza areas in Times Square. It would increase public space amenities. And lastly, it would help fund the increased maintenance obligations of the additional proposed concession areas. So the photo on the left here shows a view from the intersection of West 49th Street and Broadway, and the photo on the right is a potential concession layout plan for this area. So you can see that they have two 10 by 10 concession tents um, that are in a green color, and on either side of those concession tents there are cafe tables and chairs, and there are also granite blocks surrounding these and planters section off this area from the bike lane. So in conclusion, or sorry about that, the applicant requests a major concession to expand the existing pedestrian plaza areas in, in Times Square that will allow for the consistent management of these areas. And on February 8th, Community Board 5 voted uh, 
33 to 0 with one abstention recommending approval of the Times Square major concession project. And the board also expressed their desire to be involved in this in the discussion of concessions and public plazas more broadly. And on March 13th, the borough president recommended approval of this application as well. Additionally, at the January 2nd review session, the commission had questions regarding the programming of the concessions, and I've included the applicant's responses um, to those questions in the briefing packet. And to summarize, this application does not determine DOT's street design work and concession activity is not permanent or fixed but this application would instead allow TSA to manage all the public spaces as they evolve. And that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much. So um, by defining the area, and we'll obviously pick this up at a public hearing on Wednesday, but by defining the area, any individual concession still needs to be negotiated with the Department of Transportation. Is that correct? Sorry, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jenny. We'll we'll pick this one up on Wednesday. Thank you, Ezra. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the fifth item on our agenda is a City Council modification scope determination for the East 94th Street rezoning in, in Manhattan Community District 8. The City Council proposes to modify the zoning text amendment to Appendix F, uh, removing MIH Option 1 and adding um, MIH Option 2 and staff believe this modification is within scope. Great, any questions on the scope? Okay, I'll seek assent by a voice vote uh, to send a letter to the City Council that modifications here are within scope. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Okay, we will send it, thank you. The seventh item on our agenda is a City Council modification scope determination for the Jennings Hall expansion in Brooklyn, uh, Community District 1. Uh, the City Council proposes to modify the Zoning Text Amendment to Appendix F, removing MIH Option 2 and adding the Deep Affordability Option, and staff believe this modification is within scope. Any questions here? Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to seek a sent by a voice vote to send that letter to the Council that these modifications are, the, are within scope. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, the ayes have it. We will send it. Okay, uh, future votes. For Wednesday, March uh, 20th, staff have prepared uh, reports for Melrose Concourse NCP, which had a public hearing at the March 6th public meeting. Yafit Shafer Sol is here to present a department recommendation on Zoom. Hello, everyone. Can you Hello, hear we can hear you. Okay, great. So today we are talking about the Melrose Concourse NCP, which was brought to you earlier at previous review sessions. This is the staff recommendation. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, this application is uh, from the NYC Department of Housing Preservation and Development. It includes three non-consecutive sites, one at 404 Claremont Parkway, one at 1169 Washington Avenue, and the third at 12 Governor Place. The actions yeah. Re yeah. required for this application are the Urban Screw Development Screw Action Screw Area Screw designation, Screw Urban Development Screw Action Screw Area Screw Project Screw approval, because, like, acquisition are, of property by the city for one of those sites, and disposition of city of land. It was certified on November 27th, and the, it will, this project will produce 71 affordable units, and 23 of those units will be heirs units, which is uh, for seniors, and eight of the units will be for previous homeless households. Mm -hmm. The Bronx staff recommends yeah. to approve this project. If there are any Great. questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much. And uh, we can go so far as to say that the department even uh, supports the project. So thank you for that. Um, great. Thank you, Afi. Of course. 
Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Also for consideration on Wednesday is 3111 Henry Hudson Parkway SNAD subdivision, which is a SNAD certification in the Bronx Community District 8. Staff have prepared reports for 281-311 Marcus Garvey Boulevard. Also, there was a memo in your weekend materials. Question. Thank you, Chair. I have a quick question. Thanks so much for the materials. They answered the, most of the questions. Just a super quick follow-up. The memo doesn't mention anything on the public lighting proposed for the open spaces. If, if you can follow up on that, I would greatly appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. Um, you could probably get a follow-up memo from the applicants uh, ahead of the, the vote on Wednesday. Okay. Um, also, staff have prepared reports for 1289 Atlantic Avenue rezoning and 817 uh, Avenue H rezoning. On 41 Richard Street, staff have prepared reports, and Jonas is here to present a slide. Hi, Jonas. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, Chair. Commissioners. Oh, it's okay. I think we need Jeopardy or music or some some type of waiting. <laughs> um, ah, perfect. Okay, good timing. Uh, this is a staff recommendation for 41 Richard Street, a private application from 54 Richard Street LLC for a zoning map amendment in the Red Hook neighborhood of Brooklyn, Community District 6. Uh, brief refresher, this application was certified on October 30th of last year. Public hearing was held on February 21st and the vote scheduled for uh, this Wednesday, March 20th, as Sarah mentioned. The department is supportive of the application, which would facilitate the development of a new seven-story, 86,000 square foot non-residential building consisting of 66,000 square feet of light manufacturing uses, 16,000 square feet of commercial office space, and 3,000 square feet of ground floor retail space. Uh, the department believes that the requested zoning map amendment from M15 to M1, sorry, from M11 to M15 which would increase the permitted FAR from one to five FAR and remove uh, parking requirements is appropriate given the context along Richard Street, an important uh, north-south corridor in the Red Hook neighborhood where other multi-story uh, loft style buildings are present. Um, and this would also um, increase access to jobs, um, both locally within Red Hook, but also within the greater uh, Southwest Brooklyn area. So for all those reasons, the department supports the application, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jenna. Okay. Uh, staff have prepared reports for 7 Northmore Street, DCAS disposition, 1521 West 124th Street, 8001 Broadway Commercial Overlay, and 9722 Crestkill Place disposition. Also for consideration on Wednesday are 177 and 183 Hillside Avenue, which is uh, two certifications and one authorization authorization in the Special Hillsides uh, Preservation District in Staten Island Community District 1 and 97 Westminster Court, a SNAD certification in Staten Island Community District 2. On Secret Type 2 Rule, uh, City Administrative Procedure Act, CAPA, there was a memo in your materials. Lastly, for Wednesday, March 20th, staff have prepared reports, prepared a report on a um, gaming facility text amendment, and uh, your materials was also additional testimony. Okay, post-hearing follow-ups. Post -hearing follow for post-hearing follow-ups, we have Cypress Hills Fulton bid formation, which had a public hearing at the March 6th meeting. There was also a follow-up memo in your materials, and Alex is here to present a slide. Hello, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I just wanted to say that in the memo, I included the um, business list that you requested, Commissioner Osorio, so that's in there for you. Um, I don't know if there are Thank any you. other questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have LIC bid expansion, which also had a public hearing at the March 6th uh, meeting. Uh, there was also a follow-up memo in your materials, and Alex is here in case there are any questions. Yeah. So uh, in the memo, I include that Community Board 2 had not voted. They then voted to approve of the bid for uh, expansion. Um, SBS also included a brochure of their industrial services that they offer, and I also included a list of the businesses in the new eastern subdistrict that's being formed south and east of Sunnyside Yards. Happy to answer any other questions. 
Great. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our last item uh, for a post hearing. We have 4725 34th Street Site Selection and Acquisition, which had a public hearing at the March 6th public meeting, and uh, Bree is here to present a recommendation on Zoom. Hi, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Um, well, the Department of City Planning staff uh, supports the applicant's request for a site selection and acquisition to provide facility space in an existing four-story warehouse and office building. Uh, this is for the Department of Transportation divisions that manage sidewalk repairs and provide ADA-compliant uh, pedestrian ramp traffic median and uh, pedestrian safety installations. Uh, the building will also provide space for DOT traffic operations enforcement and fiber optic divisions. Um, this building is suitably located in the LIC industrial business zone and is close to public transit, which makes it easily accessible for employees. The building is also um, in proximity to a major highway, which is important for the sidewalk installation teams to easily get to their job sites to install the new infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. We go to Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you, Bree. Could you just uh, refresh my recollection on uh, the current spaces that these DOT uses are uh, vacating? to come to this space and what would be the status of those spaces? So there's only one space that will need to be relocated actually, um, and it's located in Queens. I can follow up on the specific address, but this one needs to relocate uh, due to the construction of the DP uh, water tunnel number three, while as the other units are actually expanding. Oh, I see. So uh, do you know the space that we're vacating? Is that a private space or a uh, city-owned space? It's, it's a leased space, yes. So. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Just really quickly, and to follow up on the Vice Chair's question, the, we are not displacing, or the proposal will not be displacing any industrial businesses, right? No, none at all. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, Bree. Thank you. And that wraps it up for today's agenda. All right. Thanks, With that, we thank you all very much for your time. Uh, staff of the department, uh, great job today as always. Uh, and with that, we will pick this up Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock for our public hearings. We are adjourned. Thank you. The time is 12 to 28 p.m. No. We got like three outbreaks.